In the Name of Overhead Athletics podcast, where we cover rehabilitation, biomechanics, human movement, and optimizing human performance. Welcome back to the podcast here, host by Max Wardell and Carter Kowalczyk. Today, we're joined by Eric McMahon. And Eric is a former Major League Strength and Conditioning coach. He is a former collegiate strength and conditioning coach, minor league strength and conditioning coach in baseball. He's worked with athletes all across the spectrum. And now he is actually in a role with the National Strength and Conditioning Association as a coaching program manager. And so we're going to get into a lot about the National Strength and Conditioning Association, their certifications, and actually a new certification that they're coming out with. But we also want to touch on strength and conditioning across the spectrum of athletes, but particularly with high-level throwing athletes. Additionally, Eric has a bachelor's degree in biology from St. Lawrence University. He actually played collegiate football as well, and he has a master's degree in education with a focus in exercise and sports studies from Springsfield, Springfield College. So welcome to the podcast, Eric. Hey, thanks guys for having me on. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So that was just a brief little uh, introduction on you. Obviously, you've been through the CSCS yourself. You've been through other certifications, uh, you know, weight, USA weightlifting certifications and stuff like that. So you have a uh, depth of knowledge on different certification processes, but you also have a depth of knowledge as a former collegiate athlete and then as an individual who's worked with professional athletes. So maybe you could just take us, um, you know, on a little journey and how you actually got into strength and conditioning to begin with, you know, what, what got you to uh, the major league level and, you know, just kind of your journey. Yeah. So um, I grew up in Burlington, Vermont, and, um, you know, I, I always say that there really wasn't a lot of strength and conditioning around me growing up. And um, it was, I'd say my path was unique in that I had to pursue the field that really wasn't anywhere around me. Uh, University of Vermont didn't have a strength and conditioning program until I was in my 20s. I, I really never met a true strength and conditioning coach until I was in my 20s and while I was a college athlete. So, um, and, and that means that at the Division three level, you know, our football coaches were training us, um, you know, with – with a solid program, but it wasn't a, you know, there were some pros and some cons to, to that training. And that was really my pathway into the field of learning, you know, okay, the, this is what made me better. This is what, uh, you know, what, I didn't have the answers, but maybe there's a better way out there. And I really pursued that. Um, I think it always kind of starts with yourself, you know, your, your passion for, uh, making yourself as good as you can be as an athlete or as a professional, you know, not every strength and conditioning coach has a high level, uh, athletic background. I certainly didn't. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you pursue it from where you start. And, um, you know, my first job in fitness was, I was just a floor trainer at a fitness facility and, um, it happened to be where the minor league baseball team in my hometown did their training. And so uh, I also worked uh, as a parking attendant at that ballpark, you know, growing up as well. So I was around professional baseball. Um, and I remember, you know, I, I would hop in the truck and put out all the parking signs and then I'd be, have a little gap before the parking lots opened up and I'd sit in the stands in the uh what they called the best seats in the house which were the lazy boy recliners that they put in the uh on top of the cement seats as a as a giveaway and I, i'd sit there and watch bp and i remember um you know back then they didn't have affiliate strength and conditioning coaches at every level and when they did it was it was mostly interns so um i know the expos at that time and they became the nationals in my last year doing that um they um, they didn't, and most of the teams didn't have a coach with them that was dedicated to strength and conditioning. And I would only really see, you know, whether it be ladder drills or really good dynamic warmups or strength and conditioning activities when the minor league coordinator would come into town. And for some reason that, you know, that grabbed my attention being an athlete and being, a, you know, playing college football. And this was my, this was my summer job. So, um, and, uh, yeah, so that, that maybe was the spark for me, 
um, that um, allowed me to have a few conversations with with players and athletes that were on a lot higher level than, than I was. And um, it was, um, I remember uh, going through my training experience and seeing uh, a job posting um, because I became a student member of the NSCA um, as an undergrad student. And uh, I saw a job posting for a minor league internship type position. And it, not that I was, um, only cared about money, but I, I, I needed a, a little bit of, of a stipend just to be able to justify going across the country and uh, being able to have a few, a few bucks in my wallet when I got back to school that, yeah. that next semester. So, <laughs> so I couldn't be, you know, just so open-minded that I could go anywhere. And, you know, I needed to, I needed to, uh, um, have a little bit of money there. So I, I, I remember thinking, wow, this is so cool. You know, based on what I was seeing, I was like, too bad I'll never be able to afford to do something like this. Um, but I will, you know, credit all the people in the field before me because the, the field really took off around that time. And there was more and more minor league opportunities in different organizations were on different levels. Um, so in my time that I, um, you know, I coached college football for a year when I got out of um, St. Lawrence and I did some strength and conditioning there before I went to Springfield. And while I was at Springfield, I, um, I met another uh, student that um, had been hired to do his summer internship work um, with the Reds organization and uh, got me a contact in there. And uh, that ended up just through word of mouth passed my resume along to the Brewers and um, I ended up being a short season guy there that year. So it got me an opportunity in baseball to, to give it a go, but it was one of those things that to that point, I'd put a lot of thought into it. So I had a little bit of a career mentality on the front end of that. Okay. I know that I was in Helena, Montana for my first two seasons. I knew that training conditions were not going to be the, you know, this idealistic, you know, pristine weight room, you know, perfect strength and conditioning environment. And, um, I was, I was essentially conditioned to, to know that those were some of the pitfalls in minor leagues. So I, you know, I credit that all those little experiences on the front end, um, that prepared me to have success in the minor leagues and be able to, to, to continue to learn as I, as I did the job for a number of years. So that was really my path into professional baseball. And then in this role, um, you know, I think starting at a place where, you know, I didn't have strength and conditioning truly available to me, um, other than the NSCA, I, I can really give credit to the NSCA and say, you know, that career path and that track that was on the website at the time, um, you know, I always give credit to Alan Hedrick. He was a, a column editor in the um, strength and conditioning journal at the time. And when I started getting those journals, um, I always read his, his column, you know, and, and, and that made, and he wrote about a lot of different, uh, topics over the years. And so, um, to me, um, those experiences early on paved the way for me to develop a, a strong passion for this, this profession and the career path. And, and now that I'm, uh, in my thirties and I, I have a family and now I start to think of this, uh, a little bit more longitudinally and about you know sustainability of the profession and you know i don't want to i don't want this to be a profession that is only for um low paid individuals in their in their 20s or fresh out of college you know right. I, I i i want this to grow and, and and improve and and i think there's there's a great group of professionals in our industry that say hey we're not going to complain we're not going to um, back out, we're going to actually step up and um, try to make a difference and try to be the difference for this next generation of coaches, sports scientists, um, other professionals that the NSCA can help. And so we always um, strive to be as available as possible to, to all of our members, all of our certificates. And um, that truly is just my path in the field to this point. And um, yeah, I, I'm really passionate about it. And uh, I like talking about it. So yeah, and you know, maybe you could touch on this. I I don't know if you've come across the book, but uh, there's a book, uh, CEO Strength Coach by uh, Ron McKeefrey. And, you know, 
I've never been in that sector being in the private sector, but, you know, reading that book and then kind of seeing, okay, here are the, the difficulties and here are all the things that, you know, he had to do to get to where he's at in the profession. Um, you know, it sounds like, you know, you had some uh, good opportunities present themselves, but maybe you could, you know, touch on that, um, you know, for anyone that is aspiring to be a strength coach uh, in the capacity that you were um, in baseball or, or in any professional sport or collegiate sport. Yeah. Um, yeah. I read that book. Coach Mack does a great job of communicating to young coaches in the field about sort of the journey of, of what a strength and conditioning coach goes through. Um, you know, I, when I, when I see coach Mack at our conferences over the years and he, you know, he's always, you know, hosting a round table or, or just, he, he's got such a huge network and, you know, obviously he wrote that book. I think that's one lesson that you can take from some of the more experienced people in our field is that you need to develop your network um, and mm -hmm. be willing to continue to grow that network. Um, he, you know, and so it doesn't matter. Um, and in this role, you know, it doesn't matter for me if, if I have a young coach that doesn't have their CSCS that's pursuing the field, that gives me a call or someone with, 30 years in the big leagues, it really makes no difference because, you know, we have current leaders in our profession and we have future leaders in our profession. And that's the way that, um, that I, I'm fortunate that I can see the field, uh, in that optimistic, uh, way. And, and, and I, I really, uh, I'm passionate about those young coaches and that they have a track to pursue, um, higher level professional roles in, in, in there in this field. So, um, so the network aspect is, is one area, um, making yourself available communication skills, um, that, that whole CEO strength coach, uh, mentality. Um, also I think being versatile in this profession and COVID right now, there's a lot of professionals out there struggling, you know, whether, uh, especially in the private sector, but, you know, even at academic institutions, and there might be a lag at some of those institutions in terms of how it impacts jobs. Um, I know professional baseball has been impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a huge challenge that we're facing right now. Um, but being versatile in that, you know, we, we in strength and conditioning are unique in that our, our, craft isn't sport specific it, it goes it, in, in a way it's very sport general you know I'll credit uh, Mike Boyle with that term you know when he came out with the book uh, functional training for sport you know functional training is not sport specific it's sport general um, we can get very specific when we uh, when we coach and at the highest level that is important um, but as strength coaches on the front end, that base knowledge and that base um, experience level that, um, that we get is very general across the board that works for a number of different sports and a number of different athletes. And um, I'll credit, you know, being from Vermont, and I mentioned this to you guys off the air, you know, you know, being from Vermont, I could get by on a marginal athletic ability and call myself a multi-sport athlete, but, but I dig from those sports, you know, um, there's a lot of connections between lateral movement and baseball and lateral movement and in a sport like hockey or, or any other sport. Um, it's, it's how the body works. It's how the body moves. And so when the more connections you can make to, um, to sport and to, uh, to different types of athletes, I think that helps you, uh, from a communication standpoint. So in terms of pursuing this field for young coaches, I think, it's really important to focus on your personal development. You know, there's a whole thought process out there. You need to continue learning in this field. And I think that's true for any field, right? Like you, you should never be done um, pursuing this field and pursuing what's next. And I think there is a huge chase for that information. Um, but then we need to have a strong filter in that as well. And that we're not just going to Instagram for our, uh, for our top Absolutely. content, you know? And, and so I, I think it's a double-edged sword in a way where, you know, I've, you know, I heard this once, you know, you, you don't want to be so open-minded that your brain falls out. You know, it's like, you need to have a, you need to have 
a little bit of a filter on, uh, on, on what you're doing. And I think be almost a little bit protective of, of um, how you're working with, um, how you're putting your program in place and what, what kind of makes the cut in terms of uh, training that you're willing to do with your athletes versus just things that are on maybe the, uh, on the front end or you're experimenting with. Um, yeah. Now, for, Sorry, go ahead, Carter. For, uh, for all of our athletes out there, you know, you, you mentioned when you were growing up, there wasn't that much information available. So you kind of had to do your own seeking it out. Um, for athletes nowadays, we know that's not the case. There's a ridiculous amount of information out there. Do you have any tips for them and how they can kind of differentiate between good advice, bad advice, um, you know, creating a, a, a solid path for them to follow down without getting too left or right? Yeah, I think there's some layers to that. Um, I think on the highest level, right, like when we're dealing with research and putting scientific content into practice, um, I would say, you know, one of the, one of the things that I'm glad I have a biology degree with is, you know, you, the first thing you learn as a science major or as a student in, in the sciences is, is the scientific method. And really that starts with a question. And so if, uh, and this is huge as we move towards sports science and the new certification is that, you know, if you're not answering a specific question, you're really just you know, shooting in the dark. You don't have a target. You don't have something that you're trying to find an answer to. And, and so I think really narrow down what your question is that you're trying to answer in terms of putting in higher level scientific content. Um, in terms of um, vetting, you know, all of the information in the field, I think it's great to be well-rounded and, and read just as much as you can. Um, but I would say double down on application is, is double down on application and that don't just read it. I mean, it might come from Instagram, it might come from Twitter, but if it's, if it's good, if it's really going to help you, you need to uh, put it into it. practice, speak yeah. it, do it. Yeah. You know, get on, you know, and that's something that, you know, a lot of coaches and we go back to coach Mac, you know, you know, his, his, his career, he has a long career, right. But, you know, he's speaking now and he's writing a book now and he's, he's putting that stuff out there on a very uh, mainstream level. And I think we are communicators by trade. You know, we, uh, your voice is your tool as a strength coach. You need to be up in front of a group, you know, from the time you're warming the group up, you need to be able to have that group and that one-on-one -on -one rapport um, Absolutely. and so, um, developing your, your skill set as a speaker, um, you may not think of yourself as a public speaker. A lot of people, that's their biggest fear, right? Like getting up in front of people. But I, if you really want to be great in a field, not just this field, once you find that information, wherever you find it, you need to polish it and prepare it so that it's, uh, accessible um, in your short term memory that you can, that you can dig, dig from, you know, um, whenever, uh, whenever you need it and, um, really communicate clearly, um, on a, on more of a mainstream level that, uh, and I think those, I think those are important skills for all professionals. And, and I think the other takeaway is we are not insulated as strength and conditioning coaches we are professionals like any other and professional skills outside of our strength and conditioning uh, skill set are, are largely important um, to our success. And so don't just focus on, you know, squat technique and reps, you know, sets and reps and, and things that we all need to know, but the further you progress in this field, you, uh, from my experience, and I know a lot of other coaches speak to this, um, you tend to focus on other things and really try to expand yourself more as a person and, and, and as a professional as a whole. And, and I think that should sort of be the, the goal on the front end. If you, if you know that that's coming, I think it gives you um, a little bit of a heads up of, okay, I need to be able to present things clearly. And um, I might be, you know, I'd I never thought I'd be a podcast host before, but you know, like for example, you know, 
podcasts are, are here to stay, like getting up and communicating. This is, this is important. So, um, and, and for, for the, the many in our field that really care and really want to communicate and share information, it's a great outlet to do that. So, um, whether you're going to be a national level speaker or an occasional podcast um, on the side, I think it's, those are really important skills to, to develop in yourself. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you touched on a, a ton of different things there and um, you know, just to unpack that a little bit, you talked about, you know, learning from a vast variety of different um, subjects. And I was just listening to a podcast the other day, um, by Andrew Spina, who is from Functional Range Conditioning. And he was talking about how some of the most important things that he learned that he now relates to his practice and to his methodology. He didn't even learn when researching kinesiology or learning about um, anatomy and physiology. He, he learned it in a, in a totally different field or, or sometimes he'll pull from a research study that looks at, you know, it's a plastic surgery um, journal and he pulls from that about tish, tissue adaptation or whatever, but, you know, even developing those personal skills, like, like what you're talking about, you know, sometimes the, the researchers are the ones who know the most about it. But if you put that researcher in the strength and conditioning room, or you, or you put athletes in front of that um, researcher, they may not be able to uh, translate that information to those athletes and get the desired response. And, you know, and that's not, anything against the researchers. Their, their thing is to find out information, validate things, um, invalidate things. But, you know, somebody that's working with athletes, I, I think you touched on something very, very important, which is you have to be able to take what you've learned from the experts in the field, the, the people that are conducting the scientific research, and then also pull from new, new material and um, new adaptations or combinations of material, and then actually be able to uh, functionally apply it with your athletes, whether that is the Instagram video or whether that's the Instagram video combined with, hey, what I read in this textbook or this uh, piece of literature. Yeah, I, another thing that came to mind when you were, you were saying that was, you know, as a young coach that didn't really have a true mentor in the field, you know, I, I mean, I learned exercise science from exercise physiology professors, you know, I didn't learn um, I, I, I had to find strength and conditioning for myself in a way, but to do that, I read, a, I read a lot of bios of strength coaches, um, that were on the back of journals that were, I mean, the, that were on websites that, um, were kind of emerging, you know, strength and conditioning, um, college strength and conditioning websites. And I really tried to read between the lines on, okay, well, th these are the credentials that they have and these are the highlights, right? Well, you can sort of try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. This is where they're from. And this is, um, you, you know, you can sort of generalize, this is likely how, you know, they grew up and, 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 and sort of shape the career path. And, and <laughs> it was funny because I don't know if everybody pursues or, or thinks about, you know, um, you know, their career that way or in that level of depth, but it was really motivating to me to sort of find all these people out there. And one thing I noticed was there's so many unique paths in this field. There are so many where no, nobody was, nobody, it wasn't this cookie cutter model that was, um, that to be a high level strength coach, um, you needed to do this. I mean, this was a time when the CSCS hadn't really gained full traction in the field. So even on a certification level, um, there, there were, there was a lot of, uh, differences from coach to coach. And so, um, studying individuals and professionals in the field, uh, that was, uh, that was motivating to me as a young coach, but it was also very beneficial. And I took a lot from that. Um, and now I'm in a unique role where I know a lot of these people, and, uh, you know, and sometimes you're right and sometimes you're not, but that process of learning and, and growing with the information that, that you have available to you, um, that's, I think, a powerful process in itself. Maybe you could, um, you know, with the different certifications that you guys have, 
um, over at the NSCA. Maybe you could touch on, you know, how you may integrate, you know, the scientific uh, literature with practical application. Because, you know, reading um, your guys' textbooks, when you actually go through it, it gives you a practical application. But as you know, working in the field, that practical application is an example, but actually being able to, you know, take some of those um, principles and method methodologies and then applying it with athletes in the clinic, like you're, you're doing something different. Like, and that, that's the thing I think people get confused all the time when they look at, you know, Instagram and they see this uh, individual who has a master's degree in human performance and, or they're a physical therapist and they're doing a specific exercise, they automatically think, well, because that person is doing this exercise, it's good for me. Well, maybe you have a hypermobile shoulder, they have a hypomobile shoulder, maybe they had, you know, adhesive capsulitis and they're trying to improve, you know, their anterior capsule mobility. And you have, you're a pitcher who, oh yeah, I want my arm to lay back farther. And now I'm, now I'm doing that something that potentially, you know, puts me in a position where I could get injured. So, you know, maybe touching on something to do with how you can integrate, you know, these uh, elaborate uh, videos and, and blogs online in with something that actually is, um, I guess, the foundation, which is the anatomy, the physiology, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, an Functional anatomy or anatomy is a lot of times the gateway course into this profession. You know, that whole concept structure equals function. Um, when, I, when we used to teach anatomy, we would drill that into people. Um, you don't know what it does. Well, look, look at the structure of it and then try to work, you know, work backwards to it. So, um, but with that said, you know, our certifications are, you know, there's a, the term certification gets thrown around a lot, you know, and there's a lot of product certifications, weekend courses, um, you know, when you're dealing with accredited certifications, um, there's a higher level of knowledge and background that goes into that. And I think it's not to be taken literally per se, and that this is exactly what you're going to need to be doing. We, you know, the, the CSCS and as strength coaches, we know that we are problem solvers in the works workplace. And it's really, you know, the, these certifications are worthless without a curriculum, without, and, uh, without educational materials that raise the standard of the profession and raise the, uh, the, the level of professionals that pursue that track. So, um, I think it really starts with, you know, there, there's a reason that, you know, we continue to update editions of the essentials text. It's not, the, it's not the same strength and conditioning that it was uh, when the first edition was released or when I took the CSCS, it was the second edition. Um, and do we all have time to read every version of every textbook that comes out? Uh, probably not, but there are significant upgrades. And I, I just know from my current role and that I have one on my desk right now that there are sig significant updates from uh, version two to version four. And I think that is, um, that that's the true spirit of, you know, the growth of our profession. Now, uh, it, it really is like thinking of yourself as a problem solver and, it, and, really diving into, okay, well, I'm working on speed mechanics now. And as a strength coach, we have a certain foundation of knowledge on speed mechanics. And I know I, and it gives you resources to go to, and it gives you, okay, well, this is what I'm hearing here. Now I can dive into the resource, uh, into the research, uh, that's more current than the textbook. And, um, we, you know, it goes back to that scientific method, that scientific uh, process that if we're bridging the gap between science and application, we can't just be on the go all the time. And we have to, we have to look back and into the textbook, into the research and, and apply that information and stay current. And th those are some of the challenges that we have. Um, I think one of the other challenges is we're not just problem solvers. We tend to be stress absorbers in our organization for our athletes, for our families, uh, for, you know, for, for, for our environment, you know, and I think that is 
that can be a negative because it's stress, right? But it can be a positive in that people are relying on us to, to be problem solvers. And that, that does cause us stress and we need to work on being as efficient and professional as possible during these challenging times where we're kind of put under the gun. Um, and those, um, those are some of the qualities that I think are really important to um, sustainability as a strength coach in the field. Yeah, and when we talk about certifications, you mentioned, you know, an accredited certification, NCCA is, you know, the, the big one, right? And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a ton of certifications that are, like you said, weekend courses or that aren't accredited certifications. And, you know, that's, this isn't a knock on, on any of those um, certifications, but, you know, there, there is a difference. And especially when you go, you know, in terms of getting employed, um, you know, especially if you want to work in the field at, at any high level, but also in developing your foundation. And, you know, a lot of these um, courses that aren't accredited are more of that, you know, you've been, they're almost assuming that you've been through an accredited course and you've been through some form of formal education prior to, you know, enrolling in it. And it's a uh, adjunct to what you have. Whereas, you know, I see a lot of people, um, you know, online, you know, you see people on LinkedIn, you see people on Twitter where it's like, you've almost missed the formal step in the progress or in the progression, which allows you to kind of experiment with different things because you understand what those things could potentially do and the implications of them. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, the CSCS is, it's an overarching strength and conditioning certification that doesn't limit you in the ability to use kettlebells or perform Olympic lifts or um, other specific areas in, in the field. That doesn't mean there aren't other experts out there and other governing bodies that have great information to share. And, and I think as educated professionals, we need to be as well-rounded as possible. And yeah, I took the USAW course and um, a couple times actually, and uh, in, in a number of different certification programs over the years. But another, I think one of the big things that I've learned in this field is more than any certification, we are a tight-knit community in this field and there's nothing wrong with going directly to the source, you know, and I, when I wanted to learn VBT, um, you know, I, I found contact information and, and sought out Dr. Brian Mann because he was the guy that wrote the book on it and, and pursued my, you know, pursued that, uh, by going to the source. And so, um, if, if, if a non-accredited certification is valuable to you, do it. I mean, go for it. Um, but I think just because the term certification gets um, used very broadly, it, it just means a lot of different things in different contexts. Um, I, you know, I, I think we just need a little bit more understanding um, of that. And and there, and this isn't um, the fault of the practitioner at all. I think internationally there's different terminology that gets assigned to accreditation and certification and how things um, are delivered. So that's something that I, that I had to learn just in, in overseeing the sports science program, the CPSS program that's coming out in 2021 is um, a lot of the early steps were founded on some of the materials and things we were learning from um, ESSA and bases uh, in Australia and the UK existing organizations that were delivering sports science internationally. So I learned a lot about accreditation and certification through, through that um, research. Um, and uh, I just think no certification, uh, no letters after your name are going to solve all your problems. We need to be, the, we're the, we're the problem solvers. We're the dynamic professionals that, that make it happen. You know, um, I, I heard on another podcast a while back and I've, I've quoted this a few times as, you know, the, the myth of clarity, you know, I, it, it, you know, the clarity isn't something that we should expect. It's something we should provide. You know, we need to be the ones to bring clarity to our environments as coaches and our athletes seek that our, you know, our, the, the sport coaches need that from us. You know, if we're making it more complex than 
uh, and, and making it more difficult on the people around us, then that is not our job. And so um, I think we're the clarity providers. And, you know, well, it's always nice to have a, a clear job description um, and know exactly what you, you need to do, to do. I think there's a lot of strength coaches out there that have maybe never been completely in that role. So, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's my thoughts on that one. Yeah, maybe you could just go into um, your guys' new certification a little bit for sports science and, you know, kind of what the, uh, the plan is and, um, you know, why maybe how you guys are different. And- yeah, what, you guys are you know, different what, too. What's different? What's different even between yeah. you know the sports science certification and other ones that you have? So I mean, we have a number of certifications, um, but our premier certification that exists is the CSCS, and that um, you know, I, and I, I call it the premier certification just because of the academic. You know, you're, you're, it requires a bachelor's degree, and in 2030, it's going to require an accredited education program, not just to be an accredited certification as it is, it's gonna now need an accredited education program and we are working through that process now that takes some time to develop. Um, The CPSS, um, Certified Performance in Sports Scientists, um, so that is an advanced level certification. It's going to um, require higher level education. I would say it's on the levels of a, on the level of a master's level um, certification, there will be multiple tracks to be able to sit for the exam. It will require experience in the field as well. So it's not going to be something you can just take the CSCS and then a week later take the CPSS. Um, it's a higher level thinking. And I think the simplest way to describe sports science, um, I'll say two things, you know, a strength coach is a sports scientist, but not all sports scientists are strength coaches. And the true thing that differentiates what a sports scientist is, is the ability to work across multiple disciplines. If I say to you guys, you know, Carter, what, you know, what is a sport scientist? I think our, how we explain that and how, uh, how we define that, it, there's going to be a lot of variability there. And so I think it's, um, I think it's important to recognize that there's different kinds of sports scientists, you know, uh, in, in our program, we've narrowed it down to the researcher, um, uh, academic, uh, sports scientists, uh, the practitioner sports scientists, and then the technology and data sports scientists. And then within those categories, I mean, the practitioner circle under, uh, sports science is, is huge. It it does include our CSCS strength coaches. It includes physical therapists, uh, athletic trainers, mental skills coaches, dietitians. Um, I can think of a number of individuals in the field that maybe start as an RD and now they're the director of player development, or they start as a strength coach and now they're the senior director of um, health and performance at a major university. So I think that we've never had a track before those, those types of progressions are unique and they stick out because the CSCS doesn't prepare you uh, in entirely to pursue a higher level role. Um, It's more the experience factor. And so this is a a more advanced look at some of the current technology um, load management strategies and uh, an advanced level look at, how to pursue some of these advanced level uh, roles in the field and also uh, represent just the current level of data and analysis that is being utilized in sport um, beyond the weight room floor. And so I think um, that doesn't, it doesn't take away from our um, CSCS audience. I think young coaches that have their CSCS or, or um, mid-level professionals that are seeking advancement, this is gonna be a really powerful track to pursue, Um, but it's not gonna just be uh, strength coaches. The RSCC program, our our most experienced um, strength coaches in the NSCA community, that's still going to be a um, highly emphasized program in terms of uh, the coaching ability and it still will be our premier strength coaches 
Um, I think this is more for the analytical, the, the very analytical strength coaches that want to pursue um, a higher level of that scientific method approach towards problem solving. Um, another, and this is something that I think connects with overhead athletes because there's a lot of technology out there that um, relates to um, angular dynamics, uh, angular velocity, um, shoulder range of motion, all these different, you know, the K vest and all these different pieces of technology. Our field, you know, I uh, talked to Dan John a few weeks back and I, I think of when he wrote the book Easy Strength and, you know, that push, pull, hinge, squat, uh, carry type uh, fa- it's a very foundational approach and athletes can get better that way. Right. You know, so I think that foundational approach to strength and conditioning doesn't go anywhere. And there's so many athletes that will get better on that. There's also a, a more integrative and, um, very sports specific approach we see, uh, in the field right now. And that is, uh, very prevalent in the baseball world where we're looking at specific swing patterns or, um, arm slot, uh, in, in, in really trying to train the specific movement, um, of high level athletes. I think often this integrative approach gets assigned to advanced level athletes. And so I think that's a good example of how through the progression as a strength coach, we start as generalists. And then we, uh, we often get more specialized when we're dealing with more advanced athletes that need those special, um, special, that specialized level of training. And so, uh, certification like the CPSS is a little bit more in tune with that integrative approach towards training where you're, you're, you're crossing the barrier into, um, what you might see in the training room, um, um, or, uh, with in a PT clinic or, uh, in, in terms of scope of practice. Um, that doesn't mean that it's, it's a license to practice in those areas, but it's more of a, the knowledge base to oversee and oversee a department that, um, that includes that area. So, um, that, that is one example of where the CSCS is still extremely valuable. It will be a pathway to the CPSS. I think there's going to be multiple pathways and we're going to build some ancillary materials that allow other practitioners into that CPSS space. Um, researchers, we're going to really, um, they're already sports scientists in their own, in their own right. Um, and I think, but that's the gateway to train the future generations of sports scientists um, in the United States um, with a little bit more clarity as to what that job is. And so one of the other ancillaries that we're building is an educator supplement that will reflect the textbook and basically building out a undergraduate and graduate level course uh, for sports science, similar to how things progressed with strength and conditioning. So a number of different, you know, the key elements are the textbook and the certification, but there's a number uh, of different other areas that we're focusing on to deliver this in a way that um, builds a curriculum for the field to advance sports science as a profession. Um, Similar to how we've done with strength and conditioning, but we can learn from that as well because strength and conditioning still has a long way uh, to go uh, and there's a lot we can improve there as well. So um, I think it's important that we we continue to grow on both fronts. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, the thing that I like is you guys are kind of integrating it with like uh, the colleges and you talked about, you know, the CSCS and having, you know, accreditations for different college programs. And basically, you know, they have this problem uh, in the RD community registered dietitian where, you know, there's a lot of individuals with advanced degrees um, in nutrition sciences and things like that, that aren't, that aren't registered dietitians because they didn't um, complete the bachelor's degree that's accredited. Is there any way that, Hey, you know, I went and got an exercise science degree. Now I'm pursuing my master's. You know, are you guys considering those types of things as, you know, just jumping back to, you said your 2030 plan um, for the CSCS. That's a great question. I think one of the challenges with the CPSS and, and really restricting it is that, um, and I, and I don't have a 
clear answer on this because it has any, we're still working on some of these areas, but I think one of the challenges with really restricting um, who can uh, sit for this exam is that sports science is, uh, is an even broader profession than how I described uh, strength and conditioning with the number of backgrounds. I mean, you might have uh, a background in biomechanics or math, data, statistics, uh, engineering. Um, there, there's so many outside areas that maybe we wouldn't consider um, to be performance and sports scientists, but are have a place at the table right now and contribute uh, with that knowledge set. Uh, we need people to implement the tech that creates AMS systems. And, you know, tech is a huge part of sports science. Um, I think it, it's more than just, you know, strength and conditioning plus tech equals sports science. It's not that it's, um, but tech is helping us solve problems that we haven't, that we've had the knowledge about, you know, sports science is not defined much differently than it was 20, 30 years ago, but the tech has made all of, you know, whether it be HRV or any of these types of measurements much more accessible. And so, um, in including a little bit broader audience uh, in the sports science community, I think is really important. Um, and that's something that we are uh, working through right now in terms of how to keep this a, a high level, um, but not slam the door on people that really can help shape this industry and make it better um, in the future. So there's, there's definitely some, some long-term strategic planning in place. And, you know, with that said, you know, this has only recently become public, but early stages of this project go back to 2018, where, um, you know, top experts in sports science from around the United States were brought into the NSCA for a, for an initial panel conversation to really get to the, um, uh, get to the core of what this needed to be. Um, and this was a third party study that was, uh, was implemented, and we described that on our on our uh, CPSS website, uh, nsca.com. And it's, um, I think, that's the way we are approaching this. In that, you know, we we were going to launch this next year, and, but it's going to continue to de develop and grow, and it's going to uh, impact the field for a long time. And um, to do that, it it can't be a very it can't be a hundred percent this rigid thing that has no potential for growth. Um, and I think most people can connect with that just in their own um, programs that there, there needs, there, there is a dynamic nature to any program or any certification that this is gonna evolve um, just as the field will evolve and grow, so. Awesome, awesome. Do you guys have any future plans for nutrition, like sports nutrition certifications through the NSCA? Um, so I would say if you're a RD or, or, or a nutritionist that is, you know, the CPSS is a great track for you to pursue a high level, uh, advancement within the NSCA community. You know, like I said, that an, an RD is a practitioner sports scientist, just as a strength coach is, they, they just have a different level of expertise and a different, um, a different knowledge base in a one specific area. Um, but I know in the RD, um, the, I know in the RD community, there's a lot of great, uh, dietitians that know strength and conditioning or have their CSCS. And so I, uh, while there aren't plans to have a specific nutrition certification, um, similar to how I, you know, think of the CSCS as an overarching strength and conditioning certification. Uh, I think the CPSS is going to include those, um, those advanced level RDs that want to pursue higher level roles as well, but not, not specifically on the nutrition side. What kind of program are you, are you guys looking at? Is there going to be a course? Is it going to be similar to structure to the CSCS? Um, is there going to be you know, I know you, you just briefly mentioned, you know, having some uh, college courses. Um, 
that may pertain to it in some way or be orchestrated or curriculum designed by you guys? Yeah, um, it will be an exam um, that you need to qualify to sit for. Um, it, you know, similar to all of our exams, they'll be hosted at a testing center. Um, the format of the exam will be uh, likely different than what you've seen on our other exams, but you know, in, in, in the spirit of a testing center and multiple choice questions and those types of things, mm -hmm. I, I think that it will be a consistent format with what people have seen, um, just more the delivery of the content and the, the type of uh, material will be on a little bit higher level than, um, than the CSDS exam. Um, but with that said, you know, there's a huge experience component with uh, with sports science and a lot of it is very context-based and very um, very much situation to situation. So um, I think that needs to be reflected in this as well. You know, there's a concept of best practices um, in sports science, whereas, you know, we tend to be very idealistic as strength coaches, um, but best practices really reflects your environment and doing the, making the best decision for what you have available in that moment. Um, and so I think um, as we deliver this, that that's an important concept as well. So there will be some differences in terms of how the test is delivered. Um, like I said, there'd be multiple tracks to sit for the exam, uh, but it will be delivered in the same, uh, same way that we deliver other exams. Oh, did you did you say a release date? When can we expect the CPSS? Uh, quarter one, uh, to 2021, I would awesome. say in that, you know, February, March range is, uh, at least for the textbook, we, we expect there to be a one to two month lag on, um, on the exam just to give a little bit of time for preparation. Right. Uh, but that's, that's intentional. So what kind of, um, you know, you talked about different tracks um, based on education level, and then you talked a little bit about how different um, professions may have, you know, different avenues uh, through the CPSS. In terms of, you know, study time, you know, things to start looking into at this point, if someone's like, hey, you know, this is, this is what I want to do. Do I wait for the textbook? Do I... Um, you know, pursue something else through the NSCA? Is there, is there another um, uh, resource that I can, you know, begin looking into that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, I actually got that question um, this morning from someone else. Uh, that's a great question. It was someone pursuing their CSCS and they're like, and they were a uh, professional uh, already internationally. And it was, should I just wait for a year and sit for the CPSS or should I get my CSCS as a track into, into this? And I, and I think it can go either way, you know, um, do you need to have your CSCS to be a sports scientist? No, but um, I think strength coaches add a lot to the sports science space. And I think that background, um, we tend to be the, the generalist that works across, you know, multiple departments as strength and conditioning coaches anyway. So I think it is a great track to, to, to go that route. Um, and I, and I can say that as the coaching program manager, um, you know, in, in my role, I think, you know, the, the skill set of coaches, you know, there's a lot that we've been trying to convince the world of for, for a number of years, but this is a perfect example of, I think strength coaches will thrive through this program um, on the practitioner side. Um, but in terms of, yeah, there will be multiple tracks. I think there, um, I think it's important that, um, you know, we keep, you know, that we keep some level of broad entry level um, for to sit for the exam or, broad, you know, the prerequisite requirements, but it will be a high level exam. And so um, in terms of materials, I would say um, similar to uh, similar to how we would approach studying for a CSCS, I think programming and periodization is gonna be a concept that um, is touched on. I, uh, you know, load management um, is, is a huge part of sports science, but that is 
um, one of those terms that can be interpreted a lot of different ways. And I think just like all of our certifications, you know, prepare yourself as a problem solver. So whether you're working on force plates or whether you're using a linear encoder or um, an EMG or any of these different technologies that are out there um, reflecting concepts of load management, HRV, um, through different technology platforms through, um, I think that would be a valuable uh, knowledge base for, um, for a sports scientists to be able to look at it a little bit more holistically because one of the real tasks of a sports scientist is to, when you have that question that you're trying to answer, to determine the best technology and the best platform, maybe not technology, but uh, to, to answer that question. So you need an advanced knowledge of all of those uh, management and um, research uh, tools that, that exist. So, and then like we've talked about nutrition um, has a space in this. Um, so, you know, in a way, you know, nutrition, psychology, all of these other areas, those are in the essentials text and the current essentials text for the CSCS is, um, has been updated a number of times. So I think that um, that's not a bad place to start before the uh, Essentials of Sports Science textbook comes out. And um, that will be in 2021. So it'll, it'll really take it to the next level. And uh, a little bit of a snippet of some of the materials. And there, so there is, um, I encourage all the listeners to join, uh, if you're on Facebook, join our special interest group, um, Sports Science and Performance Technology. Um, you just answer a couple questions, you'll get brought into the group. There's a lot of, um, say, spoilers in there, including an outline for the textbook, not the full chapter list, but um, that'll come out later as we get closer to publication. And it'll give a little bit more of that information that, um, that can help steer early studying. Um, the, and I think it'll help the process there. Awesome. You know, I think uh, what you guys are doing is awesome because the profession really needs something like this that can, um, you know, almost uh, take it to the next level. And I, I, I'm totally with what you're saying where there's a, there's a diversity of, uh, you know, perspectives in the profession. And I think that an interconnection between each uh, different portion or each different uh, subsection of the strength and conditioning field or even the human performance field um, needs to have an understanding of the other the other uh, aspects as well as you know how they can optimize um, what they're doing to fit into the general scheme and I know that's something we've talked about a ton just with you know physical therapy and strength and conditioning integration because you have these athletes come through physical therapy they need to be discharged. Insurance is only going to pay for so long. They need to go to the strength and conditioning professional and the integration. Um, you know, and I just got uh, Sue Falcone's book about, you know, bridging the gap between rehab and performance. And, you know, this sounds like not only that, but, you know, an added layer, which is optimizing what you're doing with the current science. And then ultimately, um, you know, advancing, uh, your career, but also um, your effectiveness um, with athletes and your understanding of the whole continuum there. Another thing is there's always going to be high resource programs and low resource programs. And a high resource program is one that you're going to have a dedicated sports scientist. You might even have multiple. You might have a biomechanist and a, someone doing physiology testing or um, motion analysis or all sorts of technology in play, right? Um, but then there's going to be programs and, you know, I can speak to it as a division three athlete where, you know, you might have one strength coach or, or you might have one or two and the, the coach. assistant strength. Yeah. yeah. The coach is the strength you, coach. Maybe. Well, <laughs> and, and that too, but you, you know, there's going to be situations where that assistant strength coach becomes the, 
de facto sports scientists on staff just because they want to use a piece of technology or they and, and to to what that's worth i think this program is going to improve the level of education we get as sports scientists whether your role is as a strength coach or as a sports science coordinator or generalist in the field of sports scientists or whether you're a professor working as a in a practitioner role as a sports scientist so it's going to um, i think that curriculum and the knowledge that goes along with it is just uh, maybe more valuable than just the the credential itself um, because i think that's what's going to st help steer the the clarity of the field um, towards this inclusive and integrative uh, model that we've been talking about yeah absolutely you know, on this podcast, I kind of wanted to get into, you know, strength and conditioning for, you know, the throwing athlete, but I think we're going to have to save that for the <laughs> next time we've gone into a ton of depth here, which is what I think people are, are really looking for. You know, I've, I've had people texting me. Um, it was like, Hey, did you hear NSCA is coming out with a new certification? And this was like the day after I saw your, uh, your LinkedIn, um, post uh where you threw the link up and stuff so i was like you know what we need to uh we need to find out a little bit a little bit more here and i think this is the type of information that people are kind of looking for on it and i'm i'm happy that you guys are doing it because you know i'm always looking for more education for myself but i always have people that are you know in their undergraduate studies is like hey what what you know should i aim for what should i shoot for and so um you know, having something of this, of this magnitude and kind of having a multiple pathways into it is, is something that, that we definitely need. So, um, you know, just to, to wrap up a little bit here, um, you know, I've asked every guest so far and Carter's asked every guest, like, what is one thing that you would leave the audience with, um, you know, as a professional, whether that's a physical therapist, which is a large percentage of our following or a strength and conditioning coach or somebody that, you know, works in the private sector, um, more as like a performance specialist, what's, what's one thing based on your experience that you would leave them with, if that's possible? Yeah, I, for me, I always felt like this field was more of a calling than what I, than just what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of fear in this profession. There's a lot of how am I going to be able to support my family or, you know, I'm, I'm moving right now. I'm in the process of moving. I'm, if I, if I lose my job, I'm going to have to move cross country for another one. What, you know, what those, um, I remember my first two years in baseball, there was, um, there wasn't a lot of coaches coming back. And, and that was just a testament to the jobs at the time that weren't very good. So, um, yeah, everybody has a different journey. And, and I was talking to a coach recently who had about five, six different stops in the time that I was with the Rangers over 11 seasons. So um, I, I really feel for, for those coaches that have struggles in their journey. And I, I in this role, I, I love, my favorite part is just being able to connect with coaches and be an ear for you know, the struggles that coaches are going through and um, actually have a position that I can uh, try to make that better. And if I can't make it better for, for you in that moment, maybe I can help to make it better for that next generation or that next coach that has a similar type situation. And, and that's what I'm really motivated to do in this role. So I'll leave the audience with that. Um, my, uh, awesome. my contact information, um, yep. Eric dot, McMahon at nsca.com. I'm also on social media, Eric McMahon CSCS. That's Twitter and uh, Instagram. And then I'm also on Facebook with the um, special interest groups, as I mentioned before. So I'm easy to track down even on LinkedIn, like you guys did. And, uh, you yeah, know, so. Uh, Could you throw I, that I, name up for that special interest group on Facebook one more time? Yeah, it was uh, sports science and performance technology. It's a, awesome. the newest uh, NSCA special interest group. Um, so it's uh, we have 860 members as of this morning, and it's only been up for 
uh, a couple months. So that's that's really fast growth for us for a SIG and, and for us. So um, it's growing quickly, and there's over 30 countries represented in that group, which I'm I'm really proud of. I think it um, I think that's really exciting for the program. So yes, awesome. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I'm, I'm hoping we can get you on again at some point to you know, yeah. talk more yeah. about the ins and outs um, in the profession and, and working with throwing athletes. Carter, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, touch just before we sign off here? No, no, I really, I just, I like his very diverse uh, perspective on things. You know, coming from a, I was educated by the Jesuits. <clears throat> they preach, you know, you have to, exhaust all your options to make sure you're on the right one so you know it sounds like a little bit of what you do in the weight room when as well as your education and you know it was, it was really refreshing to hear and I also I love the idea of I mean your CPSS could be the you know a, a big connecting link from amongst all the inner professions so yeah it's really exciting I mean, stuff I think it, forward to it. I think if we think of it as a unifier uh, yeah. it, 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 it can be right but if we right. don't give it that chance to be, then, then we're not going to get there. So, right. um, but yeah, really appreciate you guys, Max Carter. Thanks for having me on. Uh, yes. Thank pleasure. you. Thank you a ton. I'm Max Wardell. Carter Kowalczyk. The name of overhead athletics signing off. Signing off.